it's so interesting how light and color can be sculpted into not only two-dimensional objects but three-dimensional objects and that's really where I've been motivated to work with the material is I'm really interested in neon in the round and not using it as signage or wall decoration but as objects and making like Afghan blankets and like home hearths and stuff like that and it's like finding ways that like you want to walk around it but it also feels warm and inviting neon lights i'm baffled pick it apart like samples give me all i can handle light me up like a candle i'm taming lightning curse it got that lightning plasma in my veins Welcome back and welcome to the Taming Lightning Podcast. I'm your host, Percy Eccles II, an artist, alchemist, and educator based at the Pittsburgh Glass Center. Here, I am at the forefront of pioneering the development of a space dedicated to the emergence of plasma and neon light art. Through my personal explorations, guidance by mentors, and rigorous self-study, I've discovered vibrant networks of experts and institutions, fostering insightful conversations with fellow artists, makers, and leaders whose knowledge and experiences are intertwined with plasma, neon, glass, and beyond. Through this podcast, my aim is to broaden our understanding of plasma and neon light and to explore the creative potential of electrified gases as an expressive medium. Beyond that, it's a platform to shine on a well-deserved spotlight on the remarkable individuals who embody these fields. Join me for another engaging episode of Taming Lightning. Today's podcast is proudly sponsored by Alta Robbins, a leading provider of precision engineering solutions. In the realm of neon signage and plasma artistry, Alta Robbins is known for their high quality valves. With a focus on reliability and efficiency, Alta Robbins valves are meticulously engineered to seamlessly handle the demands of these creative processes. Alta Robbins understands the importance of precision in every neon field tube and plasma sculpture. Their commitment to excellence is evident in their products, making them the go-to choice in this field. Visit their website at altarobbins.com to explore the range of valves. If you have any questions, you may call them at 801-785-1114. Or email them at altarob at digis.net. You can find links in the show notes. Hello, Lightning Tamers. This is episode number 54. And in today's podcast, recorded May 18th, 2023, I'll be joined by Kate Heron on the second to last day teaching a workshop at Toledo Museum of Arts Glass Pavilion. We'll talk with Kate about her experience making art through COVID, what brought her to glass, Alfred University's program and her introduction to NEON, teaching plasma here at Toledo, and what's next after getting her master's in fine arts. Welcome to the podcast, Kate Heron. How Thank you doing? You. Thank you for having me. I'm good. It's late, but I'm good. <laughs> yeah, we're at the end of the day because I know she has to get out of here pretty soon tomorrow. Uh, has a long drive back. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your, your your background in the arts? Like, what was some of the early things that got you interested in, and kind of keyed you into uh, artists is what describes what I I want to do. Okay. Yeah. Well, I guess it all started way back in high school when I took my first ceramic class because prior to that I never really thought I was good at art in all my art classes and stuff like that I was always just the average kid who got passed through and then I took the ceramics course and I really fell in love with the process of making and the steps that it takes to actually like have a final work at the end and then like reflecting back on that and not only thinking about the process but thinking about how that had pushed me to the final work mm -hmm. and the importance mm -hmm. of the conceptual idea that's driving that whole process mm -hmm. um 
eventually going to undergrad, I continued with ceramics and then found glass. And I took an intro to glass class because it was like the big thing to do is like the one extracurricular, like for funsies class um, in undergrad. And I took it and I was instantly hooked. Like the... <laughs> The first day of like standing in front of the furnace as like um, my professor opened the door and just getting hit with the heat, but being scared, but also being like, this is awesome. And before I knew it, I was spending countless hours in the studio, jumping extra benches, trying to get as much time as I could. Um, Yeah. And ever since Mm. I've just found every opportunity to get in the hot shop I've always said yes to any opportunity that gave me access Mm -hmm. so yeah so glass was like seen what what is it about glass that it's like the funsy thing and then like what was the mood from ceramics then Mm -hmm. going into glass what did you notice to shift in sort of the vibe between how those two mediums are treated in your in your undergrad. Yeah. Um, for me, I felt... I never felt more a part of a community than being in the hot shop and having to work collaboratively with my peers, especially early on, to make the objects I was interested in making. Mm-hmm. That I didn't have all the skills and the tools, but my other peers did. And having six people all coming together so willingly to help you and be hot and sweaty and just like dragging this oversized way too thick walled piece back and forth to the glory hole like that really set me on this journey of I want to be a part of this environment and this community opposed to like ceramics I felt very much an individual making my work the only time I really felt like I was in a community that was really constantly collaborating was when I was doing atmospheric firings Mm -hmm. um because it takes so long to like fire those and it's so laborsome especially if you're doing like wood firings um or salt or soda firings like you want to take shifts so that way you're not burnt out and tired, but it wasn't the same kind of, uh, I guess like invigorating energy for me. I didn't get the same, uh, release of like endorphins and the, the high that I found when I found glass. Hmm. So when you, you also do other processes other than hot glass. Yes. Um, can you tell us what other things that you have found yourself using or experiencing or manipulating in glass? Yeah. So most recently I had my MFA exhibition that was titled um, From Comfort to Contempt. And each piece kind of was a different expression and use of the material of glass. So I was working on everything from blown forms to solid kiln casting to um, neon and utilizing those different skill sets to make um, sculptural pieces that were relying on a lot of found objects and actually... uh, build a lot of things from Lowe's. <laughs> <laughs> Not um, sponsored. A lot of, yeah, a lot of, uh, a lot of my materials came from there. Um, just as easy access and thinking about um, the work that I was making and what it means and what it relates to. So I was really enjoying like playing with the optical quality and using density and color and quantity and size to really exaggerate and push these um these new representations of these objects that i was making Hmm. so so you're so you're saying that when you're started getting into casting a neon that happened during this run through your master's program 
Yes. I got a little bit of experience doing kiln casting in my undergrad. Um, and then I brought that actually into when I was teaching. I did mm. some classes with some students. Um, but it wasn't, I didn't really have the, the facilities to really scale up mm. more than like the size of an object that was about a football. Right. And mm. now, luckily, like the facilities I had access to, I was able to really push um, the size, the quality. I was just getting all of these new facets that I didn't have access to before and finding all these new qualities of it. How much time between your undergrad did you end up starting your, your master's program? And what were some of the decision makings that said, hey, I, I want to go to Alfred or, or I want to pursue this master's in fine arts? Sure. Um, when I was an undergrad and I was, it was, uh, it was 2020 and I had my BFA, uh, thesis and my show opened on Friday and the whole world shut down on Monday. Mm. Um, so, but prior to that, I always knew that I wanted to go for like higher education. I'm really motivated to teach and to share all my knowledge. And I really like working with students that can, that can really process and push material. And that comes with like time and that comes with age and that Mm -hmm. comes with experience. So I would really love to like continue into higher education and um, I'm looking more towards that in the future. So I didn't know I wanted to go for my master's because I want to teach, but also because I did feel a little robbed that my show opened the like first week of March and then the whole world shut down. And I was so like originally going into that last semester I was so motivated and so interested in like all right I'm making this big push to my show and then I was gonna have like a nice release of like I can make things again that aren't I don't have the pressure of having to have this fully fleshed out conceptual Mm -hmm. idea so I felt like I got kind of lost and then shut down I lost all my access and Mm -hmm. so I ended up making like things out of cardboard at home and like found bottle glass I was like spray painting to like make sculptures in my parents driveway (laughs) 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 and like photographing off of ladders and um yeah so like 2020 the spring of 2020 happened and we were in lockdown and um then come fall of 2021 no 2020 yeah I had a few more education classes to finish up Mm -hmm. and then in spring of 2021 I went through my student teaching process um so about four months of teaching in a rural k-12 school district teaching everywhere from kindergarten um through 12th graders in high school and it was really early on in the process that I started applying for grad schools. Um, like most of them closed like really early in the spring. So that like Christmas before and that kind of time I was like putting together my portfolio and trying to like, I really think I just needed something to like kick start me back into the making process Mm -hmm. because I had lost so much access and I just wasn't feeling very motivated, like not motivated in the way that I didn't want to make, but motivated that I was like missing out on the ability to, Mm -hmm. I didn't have the funding. I didn't have the, the access. The world was still so tightly closed. So I'm like, well, I'm not quite sure where my life is going quite yet. Like I want to teach, so I'm going to push and get my licensure and teach. But in the meantime, I want to also keep extending my career. So I'm also going to apply at the same time for my master's program. Mm -hmm. Um, I applied to a few different programs. I was mostly, again, (laughs) I needed some source of funding to be able to afford as many other people do, which is why Alfred was one of the schools that I looked to, um, having a tuition waiver um, that 
allowed me to be able to go there and access the facilities um, in a way that I wasn't having to severely financially burden mm-hmm. myself. Um, and I'm I'm so happy I did because I feel like <laughs> it really has um, reinvigorated me and I've brought a lot of that teaching experience and working with kids all day into like what my thesis show was. They've really inspired me to make work and be really concerned about the next generations and how what I'm doing and everybody else around us and parents, family members, even people who don't have kids, like how do you affect other people in your environment and like how vulnerable are, are we? So, yeah, that's, you know, that's wild. (laughs) You know, uh, I, I can't imagine that sort of situation where like you have this thing anticipation and it just disappears from you immediately after you get it put up. Yeah. And, but like you, you found this, this strength Mm -hmm. in creating. And then you said, I need to create and I need to be able to share this with people. I want to teach. And I, you know, if that didn't happen, I don't think we would have run into each other. Oh, I don't think so either. <laughs> I definitely don't think it's, so either. Uh, a certain set of circumstances set in motion mm-hmm. years beyond our knowing. Yeah. Um, and and so that 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 brought you to Alfred and mm-hmm. give me uh, two pros and a con for Alfred. Ooh, that's that's good. Okay, pro the facilities. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Everything, it, yeah. anything you possibly want. <laughs> Oh, yeah. The facilities. Um, Another pro, I love, Mm. like, the people I've met, the cohort, the networking, the artists that they bring in, and the scholarships that they help students obtain, and really networking. Like, that's how we met, (laughs) because you were brought in, and um, (laughs) I have met so many great people, and so many great people have come through that have helped me grow um, as an artist and as a professional and I hope to like keep doing that and keep supporting that um con it's really rural there is one stoplight and you're you you do get very locked in um so it is it is a con but it's also a pro because Mm. there's not the extra stimulation of like being in a city you you focus you really you spend those hours those countless hours like you know i'm putting in 12 hour days and like it's nothing because i don't have distractions of other things going on as fun as it is to like go up to rochester you know and hang out for the day but like i really took the opportunity to go to grad school to sit down and focus for just two years and just commit the time in, in a place that I can just zone out from the rest of the world. Mm. Um, so it's like a pro and a con. I like that you turn that con into a pause. I was actually hoping you (laughs) were saying, going to say that and do that because just because things are pros and this, because things are cons doesn't Mm -hmm. mean that they are inherently good or inherently bad. Um, cause I noticed the people that are there when I visited, they either really love what they do and they get mm-hmm. to focus on that. Yeah. Um, and it shows that the people that are there either temporarily as students or there for a longer term as staff or, you know, uh, residents, mm-hmm. uh, they, they're there because they want to be there yes. and they are able to really focus on things. And then if they want to get away, they, take the time to get away mm-hmm. but when they're there they're getting stuff done and there's there's always seems to be someone that that you that can lend a hand or lend a ear or lend some sort of you know knowledge or wisdom around there yeah that's what i enjoyed on when i my visit on campus there's just always somebody around and it, it can be like everybody gets hits the crunch time of a final and everybody's in there installing at like 11 o'clock at night and you text somebody you're like do you have the clear filament wire because my piece is not hanging from the <laughs> ceiling and like somebody's there somebody's always there and uh, really committing and focusing in and i would if that's your goal and that's what you're motivated to do it is the place to go 
the community is unbeatable and the environment is also it's consuming in a really positive way hello podcast listeners i want to thank everyone for the support for taming lightning especially those who are supporting me through patreon they help cut the cost of hosting the podcast and for their contributions receive some additional benefits We have four new patrons who have donated on Patreon at the $5 tier for co-learner qualifying for the personal shout out on the podcast. Thank you, Jerry Jensen, who is a big supporter of Neon and Plasma art. Thank you, Uncle Earth, for breaking ground for Neon and Plasma as he builds and develops his studio in Philadelphia, PA. Thank you, Patrick Tetro, for your cross-country journey as a co-learner of both Glass, Neon, and Plasma. And lastly, thank you, Jacob Fishman, a master among masters in Neon and a supporter of those eager to learn. Additional perks for the Patreon includes free downloads of 3D printable files, learning materials and tools, and then you also get early access to the podcast. And Lastly, the Patreon token added to the listing on my Taming Lightning page of patrons, where I try to include everyone that has supported the Taming Lightning podcast, be it donations on Ko-fi, guesting on the podcast, small fundraisers, and even gifts, be it supplies, equipment, and or services. Now, I, I made a few new updates on my Patreon. If you're not a Patreon member, you can actually take advantage of our seven-day trial to explore all the benefits on offer. This means you can download the models for free and maybe grab the tips or Together in Progress guides during your first seven days and see how that enhances your experience. Join me on Patreon at www.patreon.com slash taminglightning. Now, back to the podcast. And you're you're really hooked on neon, like you're so hooked on this process that you're willing to commit to allowing that practice to continue past, um, past your your time at Alfred. Um, t- tell me a little bit about why is it what what's what that commitment like? Wh- like why why are you wanting to do neon? <laughs> sure, um, <laughs> I hmm, that's a great question. Well, public access studios and video only taught like every so often. And it was like Sunday nights or something like that. It didn't like work out with either like my, my work schedule or my school schedule. And, but I was really like, so in awe of like seeing the phenomena and the light and like the tangibility and like knowing in the back of my mind that like, I know how glass works. I can figure this out. So that is another reason also why I was so motivated to apply to Alfred and on top of um, like finances was the phenomenal neon program that's Mm -hmm. there. Um, taught by Sarah Blood and this last semester um, with Stephanie Lifshitz as our visiting artist. And uh, they're just so powerful people who really are motivated to teach and share the knowledge of how this phenomena works. It's so interesting how light and color can be sculpted into not only two-dimensional objects, but three-dimensional objects. Mm. And that's really where I've been motivated to work with the material is I'm really interested in neon in the round and not using it as signage or wall decoration, but as objects and making like Afghan blankets Mm. and like home hearths and stuff like that. And it's like finding ways that like, you want to walk around it, but it also feels warm and inviting. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Neon's unique. Um, I find there's a difference in a space that has LED versus one that has neon. Mm-hmm. And I'm not on the side of having to fight for either one of those things. It's always about quality, regardless of what you choose. But there's something about neon that speaks to be like warmer. 
if it's if you have neon sort of representing like a social space like a barber shop or a hairstyle yeah. space um that sends a different message especially even a restaurant that has like a higher class feel to it neon speaks a welcoming language where led can be very bright it can mm-hmm. be a little bit too bright and feel sterile I couldn't agree more with that. Like, <laughs> that's exactly how I feel about it. <laughs> um, do you feel, how do you feel you were prepared for investing in Neon after your time in Alfred? Sure. Um, I just bought myself a 16 inch used ribbon burner and a hand torch, and I'm currently looking for a crossfire. Um, and I've been, again, very thankful for the people that I have met and the mentors I've obtained at Alfred that have helped me design a setup for myself. So I had just graduated this past Saturday and then I drove all the way out here to Toledo (laughs) and now I got to go pack up my apartment and move. Um, which is like great though, because Mm. I'm so excited to move and like take all these drawings and the materials that I'm going to ship to my house and really like this summer, um, invest in getting my studio up and going. And really, again, I, I want to commit to my practice and I'm, I'm more motivated than ever. And I, I know that I can build the access for myself. I felt like with the pandemic, I was in such a fear and I have felt like I was at such a loss of not having the thing that brought me the most joy that like now with like this reinvigoration of making and community and all these new people that I've met that are also highly motivated individuals, I feel Mm -hmm. just so welcomed and I'm just so excited to be able to bend and do commission pieces and make my own work and really just even push my networking as much as I can. Mm. So you hear that people she is going to be moving soon so she'll be in or near the pittsburgh area so those of you who can keep an eye out for me uh, and kate uh send uh an email saying hey we found some crossfires some old equipment she needs that help so you know reach out I'll, i'll leave the email at the uh in the post and at the end of the episode uh, so with the crossfire, are you looking for, do you like the knife edge sort of setup? Or are you looking for like the, the five by five crossfire setup? Um, I'm looking for a fishtail head. Um, if it's a cannon fire, that would also be okay. Cause I'll just get fishtail um, heads for it. But um, if anything, if anybody does have just the fishtail heads, I'd love those. Cause I know I can build my own crossfire <laughs> <laughs> around them. This so. is good. Cause I feel, I have a feeling that, even though you you have you felt really prepared to be able to take on some of the equipment changes here, mm-hmm. you've also had enough contacts and people that you can reach out to to further and safely and um, provide your um, yourself with the instructions to, to continue to do this neon when you get yourself settled in. Um, and I'll, I'll, lastly, here um, this week has been pretty awesome. <laughs> um, what I've tried to do this for this class is try to take on a different uh, pace for plasma classes. Have you been a part of a plasma class uh, before, Kate? I We did a little bit of plasma with Sarah Blood um, during our semester at Alfred, but this is my first official like workshop style like class. And so, and so like doing classes like this, uh, which are often week long intensives in the summer at different locations, things have to happen fast. You may have, you know, eight hours of the day to do any of the type of hot glass or plasma related stuff. And maybe sometimes they offer an additional, you know, three to five hours at the end of the day for students to work on their own. Um, so the strategy I came in with was to, um, introduce as much necessary information in the beginning so students understand the context and give like terminology to what's happening with plasma and then start with just very basic ways of getting the electrodes on so that students can have a sealable vessel um and you know i invited kate just because she made a great impression at alfred she has skill sets in the hot shop has excellent skill shot skill sets in 
uh, neon, and those are both skills that make teaching and working with plasma so much easier. Um, I'm very impressed with how much of a help you have been and how great of a a teaching assistant you have been. You could literally just be like a co-teacher at this point based on what you brought to the class. It's been a really great week, and I can't thank you enough for inviting me. Um, it, It has just been really fun to meet so many new people and see all the different skills that everybody brought to the class with the different age range and experience levels that we had from a student that was six months ago they started to people who have years under their belts and everything that we could problem solve through together as a group honestly it just it felt exactly the community that I want to continue to be a part of. And I really think that's all thanks to you being so welcoming and inviting and putting together a class that brings, brings the right kind of people together. Yeah. I was surprised by our roster as well. And seeing, um, you know, I was, I'm typically nervous about students who may not have a lot of glass working skill, or time in the material because it can be very frustrating to work with glass when you're still becoming familiar with the steps of shaping and blowing the bubble. But um, the point of like starting out with the showing people the plasma piece before they even jump in the shop is to invigorate because these workshops are not meant to just create finished pieces. It's just an opportunity to focus, learn, and share, and learn to like especially learn together. I learned. Mm-hmm just as much as I've as I've given in this class and um even from those who like like you said someone who's only been blowing glass for like six or so months and and seeing how they're they're willing to tackle this because it could be it could be pretty easy to like give into this sense of self consciousness and awareness when you're really just among your peers who are just like you trying to do to do something new. Um, it doesn't matter like where you're at or trying to look really good in front of people. Um, you're here to learn. And it's been really fun learning to navigate the different changes as, as the pace shifts throughout the yeah. week. Yeah. I think we're going to end really strong tomorrow. I'm so excited. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> I'm, I'm excited to see the full spread of various ideas and approaches and mm-hmm. Um, before we close up here, what do you, what do you think was some of the, the challenges in, in, in trying to teach this class? I really think some of the biggest challenges were trying to meet people where they're at in skill levels and trying to teach them to use new equipment, especially the hand torches for attaching electrodes. Mm-hmm. Electroding is really, really difficult. <laughs> just splicing two pieces of tubes together is mm-hmm. really, really difficult. And it takes like in an average neon class, you spend the first like few weeks just splicing tubes together to get a good seal. Mm-hmm. And it was day one. And we had these people in the hot shop attaching electrodes and like finding ways to navigate, to make it easier for them and to take the pressure off. And I'm just so impressed. <laughs> I'm so impressed by <laughs> the way that they were able to navigate that challenge. Yeah. From a teaching perspective, I want to shift mindsets. And while they don't have an exclusive like background in that sort of thing, um, I've learned through teaching martial arts and working with people of various abilities um, that part of this, the biggest barrier in a lot of this stuff is not necessarily like skill acquisition. It's like psychology. So trying to be there with students and anyone just saying, you know, letting know, be, people know that there is, yeah, yeah we can keep going. You know, you know what's going to happen next? I don't know. Let's, let's, nav- let's walk through that. Let's walk through instead of jumping. Um, how, do I, how do I navigate making this piece? Let's break it down to, to steps. Mm-hmm. Um, this looks great. It's not, don't worry about it. Like, this could be a good piece. Like sometimes uh, we forget that we look too much on the exterior to the objects that we're making. And what plasma asks you to do is not to be an, uh, the greatest glass blower, but to be better at each turn and to look inside as well as the outside. Yeah, I definitely was talking with some of the students today and they're like, I never really 
thought about the interior of the vessel because we spend so much time thinking about the exterior shape, Mm -hmm. um, especially in functional wear. It's all about the outside lines. It's not about the inside lines. So again, like you said, you're wanting to shift people's mindset and making them rethink what a vessel, or as you title it, the envelope, (laughs) uh, will be. Yeah. Thank you, Kate, for jumping on the podcast, and thank you for joining me this week. Um, it, it really just great work. Uh, you've been able to jump in on the on the manifold. You had some experienced students jumping on the manifold, which is n- not typical for these classes. But I, I let people come in when they have the skill sets, and I can trust them with the equipment. And like I can walk away and know that you can keep moving. So that it's been great jumping in and having you jump in and and make stuff make cool stuff happen with students. Like it, it takes it takes that. It shows that you take. Uh, it shows you have a lot of care and love for what you do and for people around you. Well, thank you so much for having me, and thank you for trusting me and giving me the opportunity to uh, work with the equipment and the lovely people at the Toledo Museum of Glass. All right, last thing: where can we find you? Got a website yet? Okay, hopefully by the time you hear this podcast, <laughs> it'll be hints of heron studio dot com. That's H I N T Z O F H E R R O N s-t-u-d-i-o dot com hints of heron studio otherwise on socials on instagram you can find me at kate underscore heron underscore art or at hints underscore heron underscore studio thank you thanks thank you for listening to the taming lightning podcast music credits to the following artists in order of appearance retro by one taming lightning theme by Trav B. Ryan. Good to go by one. Next time by Haiku. And walking by Roz Hop. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Thank you, Kate Heron, for being such a great help this summer, both when I visited Alfred University and for your help in teaching at Toledo Museum of Art. It has been a unique situation where I have another artist who has the confidence, skills, and experience to make the class run so smooth. And honestly, your glowing spirit is refreshing in a world that is both figuratively and literally surrounded by darkness. And I think that notion to create not only allows us to grow, but provide a path and opportunities for others to find their expression in this world. Congratulations on your master's your marriage, and your new chapter in life, teaching art. I'd like to thank the Pittsburgh Glass Center for supporting me as a place of research and inspiration. Alfred University, both Angus Powers and Ade John Batiste for the Black Glass Artist Residency. Toledo Museum of Art and Glass Pavilion, which includes Alan Iwamura, Misha Nalepa, Fawn Denbo, and crew. And the Plasma Art Alliance, where I have an access to a well of knowledge and connects me to some amazing and supportive people. If you'd like to support Taming Lightning, subscribe to the newsletter on www.taminglightning.net or follow on Instagram at Taming Lightning. Other options for support are one-time donations through Ko-fi, spelled K-O-F-I.com slash Taming Lightning. Or you can join me on Patreon for additional perks and benefits. I'll have links provided in the show notes, so feel free to share, comment, and subscribe. And I'll see you next time. 